Um, so I was going to give you a largely live coding demo of uh, Julia and Julia interacting with R. Um, Julia is a relatively new programming language for technical computing. It's uh, designed on the premise that we want to break down this traditional two language design that has been actually a really great friend and something that's been very effective. So by the two language design, I mean, you know how you write high level code in R, but then if you really need some performance or if you want to implement a library that has to do things quickly and do you know, a lot of loops, a lot of iterations over a data frame or over some matrix, um, then you write that in C or maybe in C++. Um, and the similar design exists in Python, in MATLAB, in sort of all of these languages that you guys are familiar with using you know, to use for, for high level programming and easy, nice dynamic usage. Um, and so the, the idea here is that you want to instead be able to just write the low level code and the high level code all in one language. Which sounds like maybe a pipe dream, but we've actually had the technology for an extremely long time. Um, there were projects done in the you know, 70s and 80s where people were made high level dynamic languages go really, really fast. And lately, you know, we've seen it in JavaScript, right? Google poured a huge amount of money into making the V8 engine run JavaScript blazingly, blazingly fast. And so now we all have these browsers that you know, can do crazy things that nobody ever thought was possible pre you know, circa 2004 or 5. Um, and so this is just a project that takes some of those old ideas that were a little bit ahead of their time when they were developed um, and applies them to the area of numerical computing. Uh, numerical computing is a little bit different than what people were traditionally using these sorts of things for because you know, you have huge amounts of data. One of the big problems with a lot of these techniques like just-in-time compilation is that you generate a lot of code, um, like you know, 50 megabytes of code. But if you're dealing with uh, 100 gigabytes of data, you don't really care about 50 megabytes of code. Um, so it's sort of an idea whose time has come. Uh, the result is that you can get pretty good performance. You get the same sort of expressiveness and brevity that you're used to from your other languages, but you get performance that's like C or Fortran. Um, the drawback, of course, is starting over again and getting you know, a new language is, well, crap, now we don't have all those great libraries that we are used to having. Um, so part of our whole MO and approach to dealing with that problem is to be um, really good at cooperating. So you know, one of the first things is that you can really easily call C libraries and Fortran libraries. Just you, know, you type the name of the function you want to call, the types it expects, and then you just pass some arguments. It just works. You don't even have to write any C code to, to call a C library. Um, turns out that gives you a huge amount of access to things because all of these other systems like R, Python are actually written in C, so and they have really excellent interfaces to 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 C libraries. So if you can go th pass through the C layer, you can actually get access to them. So what I was going to demo is how you can actually pass data seamlessly back and forth between Julia and R. You can have a data frame. We have a data frame package that implements the, a similar you know similar data structure to the, the the R data frame in Julia. You can just pass them back and forth. You don't even have to copy data. Um, and so what that allows you to do is to do you know, the, as much of your analysis as you can, get, you can do in one language. And then as soon as you, you know, for example, have a library that you need, you, I want to do um, you know, some sort of clustering algorithm or some sort of statistical analysis algorithm that I don't have yet in Julia, just call the R version. Not a problem. Um, some sort of plotting that you like better in you know, Python or R, you just call that, that exact version. Um, and it can go the other way, too. You can, for example, um, let's say you're, you know, you're writing some R code and you get to a point where you have an algorithm that needs really good performance. So traditionally, one of the options you would have would be to sit down and write you know, a C package in, in, in R, or an R package in C. Um, or RCPP, that's another more recent uh, way of extending R. Um, and so now what you can actually do is you have yet another option, which is a little bit easier to work with, which is to write some Julia code that you then call from R. Um, and so I think that you know, by being cooperating, being good neighbors, and uh, this, isn't, this isn't really a competition, but I, I, I still thoroughly, I actually used to be an R programmer um, for several years and um, still thoroughly enjoy using some of the really good libraries that exist out there. So any questions? I know there's not much to ask about since I <laughs> didn't actually have a presentation. <clears throat> Hi, I really thought you. Hi, can you hear me? 
Yes, I can. I don't know about everybody else. <laughs> well, oh, there yeah, there it is. Um, I forgot what I wanted to ask. I have that effect. <laughs> yes, you do. Yeah. Um, why is it called Julia, Stefan? I, I don't know. I haven't used it. I'm not familiar with it. My favorite theory, there's been many theories floated about this. Um, it seems to be lost in the sands of time. Um, but is that it's named after Julia Child. That's my favorite theory. Yeah, that's my favorite theory. What would be the uh, best way for a newcomer to um, learn Julia? Any resources that you could recommend? Um, there aren't, there is a book that just came out, but it's not, it's a little so-so. Um, um, I think the best... What's the name of the book so we uh, Yeah, it's, it's the only introductory Julia book out there, so I'm not going to, I'm not going to name names. Um, <laughs> but, um, the, the, the Julia manual starts out pretty easy and then sort of ramps up. Uh, uh, the idea is that sort of the first half of the manual um, you don't need to know anything about the type system. So, so a couple of things that distinguish Julia from typical dynamic language, high-level languages, is that it's got a type system um, with which to talk about types. Because it turns out in numerical computing, one of the first things that happens is you immediately have to talk about types. Because you're like, oh yeah, this thing, this vector that I got here, the only thing that goes in there is floating point numbers. Um, and that's crucial for getting good performance. So, you know, and it, it, you sort of, you know, you start out with just a little bit and then, you know, before you know it, you've sort of built an ad hoc type system onto a dynamic language. So we figured, why not just do it right? Um, so Julie has this system for talking about types. Um, but the first half of the manual sort of avoids talking about them because you can do a huge amount of useful programming without ever thinking about it. And then at some point you're like, okay, well, I need to actually talk about types. And so the second half of the manual gets into that. Um, so I, I would say that the, the, the manual online is probably the best resource at this point. Um, the website has a bunch of links to introductory materials, some of which are really good. Um, the Julia meetup was on, uh, there was the second New York City Julia meetup was on, what was that, Thursday? Thursday, yeah. That's right. Um, uh, and um, Spencer Leon, who is an economics PhD student at NYU, gave a talk about using Julia for economics. Um, and one of the resources that I think is really good that's out there that's focused on economics but actually has a really great general introduction is called uh, Quanticon. Um, it's pr produced by uh, Thomas Sargent, who's a, a you know, Nobel Prize winning economist who has decided that Julia is worth um, using and talking about. So they, had, they, they maintain Python and Julia versions in parallel of everything. But that's actually a really good intro. Um, and you sort of, you know, once you get to the crazy economics part that you don't understand, you stop reading. Uh, yes. Hi, Wes. So this is a higher level question, but I mean, so Julia has been out in the open for three, you know, three maybe getting on four years. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. people are now starting to use it to build significant software projects, which is perhaps something that's anxiety inducing for language designers. So I'm curious how people have gotten on building larger software projects, which is kind of a harder, harder and more nuanced problem than simply like comparing a, you know, 10 lines of code in one language versus another and looking at performance benchmarks, the kind of cost of, you know, complex large yeah. software projects for users. Um, so it's, you know, I have a little bit of anxiety every time someone tries to implement something in Julia that the performance is just going to be abysmal and everything I've said is going to turn out to be BS. Um, we haven't seen a lot of that. We've actually seen, you know, most high-level dynamic systems end up being, you know, between, you know, 15 and, you know, 100 times slower than C, uh, you know, and we bill ourselves as having, you know, being within a factor of two usually. So what happens is sometimes someone will write the, you know, the naive version and it's like five times slower than C. They're still already ten times faster than the other version they wrote. And then usually with some tweaking you can get faster. But that's just performance. Um, in terms of building robust systems in, in the large, um, it's certainly not any more problematic than other dynamic languages, right? You have the same challenges, which is that you don't have a type checker that's making sure that you don't make stupid errors. Um, to some extent, you have a little bit better 
uh, of a situation because you do actually have this type system that lets you do some kinds of checks that you couldn't otherwise do. You, you know, you have a function and you actually can annotate what the types of the arguments are. So if you see somewhere that someone calls a thing that can only take integers and calls it on a string, you can actually see that that's not going to work. Um, but it, you know, it's still not it's not Haskell. So um, we're we're still working on making sure that that balance of being sort of dynamic and easy to use interactively versus being able to like run you know create and deploy programs is is there. Um, that's kind of a weird non-answer, but I don't know. Yeah. Yes. Um, so, how stable is Julia right now in terms of if we if there are larger software systems being built on it, um, is that safe to do? Um, is is there so a plan you, on any? Like, what do you mean by stable? Do you mean like does ba it is it just compatibility good? breaks or changes? Okay. Um, so, if you stay on the stable version, you're pretty good. But it's not going to be like our Python where well Python has its own problem with like two versus three, right? Um, the current release that is going to come out this summer is 0 0.4. We're not at a 1.0 release yet. Um, so if you're real conservative, wait until 1.0, which will probably be next summer. Um, <clears throat> 0 0.4 is going to be the most breaking release we ever have, past or future. Because after 0 0.4, it's going to be 0 0.5, which is going to be relatively minor. And then we're going to release 1.0 like, you know, at some point af shortly after that. Um, so it, it shockingly few things. There's a bunch of things that break, but it's less than I would have thought. Mm. Um, so, for example, I think that you know pre 1.0 R and Go were both much harder to keep up with. Uh, we don't. We haven't really changed many fundamental things. Uh, are there any companies using Julia right now in the commercial space, or, or do you have any adoption there? Yeah. And how do you see it evolving now? Um, so there's a lot of interest in finance. Um, uh, there is a small hedge fund that I can't give the name of that I, you know, help with uh, their tech stack, which is all built in Julia on a regular basis. Uh, there's a company called Conning, which is uh, they do financial simulations for insurance. Uh, they're based in Hartford, and they're rebuilding their current technology stack is all K. I don't know if anyone's familiar with the K language, but they're rebuilding everything in Julia. Um, and we've, there's, there's a number of other fairly big players that are looking at it or have already started. Um, and we have, we have a company, we started a, a, a company to sort of support this on the premise that, you know, open source is good at some things, but things like, you know, providing vetted sets of packages and, and, you know, the, you know, support for those packages and, you know, someone to call and yell at in the middle of the night when your things break. Um, that that's, you know, open source doesn't do that as well as a company can. So we have a company called Julia Computing that is providing that sort of support. More questions? So I'm not really familiar with this, um, with Julia again. And I, so, I was, mm -hmm. so to just understand it better, is it, both interpreted, and there's a, a compiled version, or is it always compiled just in time? It is, there's a few things that end up being interpreted, but it's almost always just in time compiled. Okay. Um, but you can, you program as though it was, you know, any other dynamic interpreted language. The semantics are just almost as dynamic. There's a few things that we don't let you do, like, you know, let's say you define a type with some fields and a structure, and you've compiled a bunch of methods for it, you can't redefine that type because then we'd have to go track down every piece of code that we ever compiled and invalidate it, which we could do, but nobody's actually implemented that yet. So, and I guess the other question I had is: there the concept of a pointer or not? I there there is. I don't. What? How do you mean? I, I just was curious as a language. Okay. Like that. Uh, so, like a yeah. yeah. Um, so we. We expose pointers largely for interoperating with C, but it's sort of discouraged and made as like awkward and difficult to use as possible. <laughs> so that's, um, anyway. All right, thank you. I apologize for this lack of presentation.